Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon taking your calls and that includes today. Uh, we are, uh, I'm, I'm broadcasting from, uh, from Arizona today and tomorrow and, uh, and Monday because I'm speaking in, in various places in the Phoenix area tonight and uh, for the next five days. If you are in the Phoenix area and are interested in these meetings, you can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, and look at uh, announcements and see where I'm speaking and uh, what time, and uh, you can join us if it's convenient for you. The number to call is 844-484-5737 if you'd like to be on the air. And we're going to go directly to the phones and talk to Wes uh, from, I think, from the Bay Area in line one. Welcome. Wes? Uh, we need Wes's line activated. I don't have control over that today. I'm, uh, I'm actually broadcasting from a car, and I don't have the kind of controls I usually have uh, for this. So I'm going to need the studio to connect uh, Wes. This is Rez. Talk to him. Can you hear me? Oh, Rez. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the call screen. I thought you said Wes. Okay, Rez. Hi. Steve, um, I've, I've, been ha I've been having conflicting ideas about eating meat lately and killing animals. I just wondered how you can help me understand if that's okay, because I've been wondering if animals maybe inherently don't know that they're going to come here and be used for food. Maybe that's what God gives them and allows them to die with grace. So that was my question. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your call. Um, so animals were not originally part of the human diet, it would appear, in Genesis chapter 2, or actually chapter 1. At the end of chapter 1, it says that God gave man uh, all the plants to eat. It does not say he didn't give him animals to eat, but it's implied that animals were not given to man to eat initially. But that changed after the flood. And I'm not sure what factors were present to cause that to change. But God did, in Genesis chapter 9, say to uh, the humans that came off of the ark after the flood, it says uh, in verse 2, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast uh, of the earth, of every bird of the air, of all that move on the earth, and of all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. Now, when he says even as the green herbs, it suggests that prior to this, I had given you only the green herbs, but now I'm giving you every animal as, uh, as possible food. Now, of course, later on, God did restrict what animals uh, the Jews were allowed to eat. They were clean and unclean animals. But at this point, God didn't make any restrictions. He said everything that moves is uh, legitimate for you to eat. Now, of course, what is this, the subjective experience of animals? Um, how cruel is it to eat animals? Well, I don't think God has any innate cruelty in him, and therefore I don't think that, uh, I don't think that he and his better understanding than we have of what goes through the minds of animals, if anything does, uh, I don't think he intends for us to be cruel. In fact, it says in Proverbs that the righteous man is kind even to his beast, Although in most cases the beasts that men had were, uh, you know, farm animals, and many of them would be eaten. Uh, being kind is simply uh, something that righteous people are. But apparently, eating meat is not necessarily a violation of being kind. Uh, animals, by the way, are the ones that we eat. At least are usually herbivorous. Uh, we don't usually eat carnivores. Not that we couldn't, but uh, it, it's, I don't think it's very desirable. But the herbivores that we eat are also eaten by the carnivores. Actually, the truth is that if we don't eat them, they will die some other way. And in most cases, they'll die at the hands of, uh, you know, carnivores. So it's possible, I think, for humans to uh, slaughter animals and process them eat more humanely than uh, a lion is likely to do or a bear is likely to do. Uh, it's a sad thing to think that some creatures are made primarily to be part of the food chain, but that's apparently the case. I mean, uh, an animal that doesn't eat other animals 
uh, is going to be eaten by animals that do eat other animals. That's just kind of the way the food chain is set up. And by the way, every animal, whether it's eaten by a man or not, or even whether it's eaten by another animal or not, uh, every animal is going to die. And so it would, you know, if we ask, what is the purpose of animals? Why do they exist? Well, we don't know the full answer to that. Certainly everything exists for the glory of God and for purposes that he had in mind. But one of the things that he seemed to have in mind was that certain animals, at least, would provide nutrition for other animals, other creatures. Uh, you know, God created a food chain, definitely. And we are part of the food chain. And obviously we're uh, at or near the top of the food chain. So uh, it, it may be hard for us because we have come to think of animals as like another kind of people. Uh, that has been a sentimentality that's been uh, built into us from probably uh, reading children's books about talking animals or watching Walt Disney movies about Bambi. And, uh, you know, we begin to, uh, to think of animals as having personhood and personalities and uh, rational thought and things like that, which, frankly, we have no reason to believe that they do have that. Um, they are like, uh, they're different than us. How much they are different, we don't know. But I don't believe that, uh, I, see, God is absolutely against murder. He's absolutely against people killing other people. So if animals in his sight were in some way analogous to people, like another kind of people, then he would be against us eating animals too. But he isn't. And uh, so I think that, you know, any sensitivity we have about eating animals, any sympathy we have uh, may be conditioned from our culture that we think of animals as kind of like pets or, you know, characters in stories that we've, we've, uh, we've seen. Uh, you know, in Bambi, of course, the hunter who's hunting the deer, he's the bad guy. He's the criminal. Bambi and, and his mom are, and his dad are, you know, sympathetic characters to us. And then the, the hunter, he's evil. He's killing those deer. But that's, that's not a worldview that's biblical. And I don't believe it's a worldview that is uh, in touch with reality either. Because, of course, the real Bambis out there, they're not thinking. They don't have the same kind of uh, thought processes and emotions that we have. Sure, they have some visceral responses that are built into them for uh, sort of a survival purposes. Fear, for example. Uh, animals do have fear of being eaten. And, uh, you know, that's, again, again, God built that into them so that they wouldn't just stand there and, and get killed off all the time. But at the same time, uh, the fear of being eaten I'm sure for them isn't quite the same kind of thing that we go through because we have a much more, you know, a complex cerebral mechanism to picture and 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 anticipate and and uh, be terrorized by thoughts about th danger and so forth. I, I don't think the animals, although they have a visceral kind of response of fear for self survival, self preservation, I don't think that they have all the mental agony that we do. I don't know, because I'm not inside their heads, but there's no reason to believe that they do, and therefore I personally doubt that they do. I don't think we have to worry about that, though I do understand, you know, the distaste we might have for killing a creature unnecessarily, uh, yet to eat it is, a, is a, 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 a rational thing to do. Even God has ordained it to be so. And again, if you don't eat it, the wolves and the, you know, cougars and whatever will get it. Uh, and the bears. So, uh, so you know, it, it's just one of those sad realities we live with. But no, it's not biblically wrong to eat meat. Let's talk to Jimmy uh, on line two. Welcome, Jimmy. Thanks hey, Steve. For uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I spoke with you yeah. a couple of nights ago about Acts 1348, and uh, I'm just going to read a couple of verses to go along with how you explained that I couldn't stay on the line that okay. night. Uh, so okay. Acts 1348, and when the Gentiles heard this, speaking about salvation to the Gentiles, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Then you went to 1 Corinthians 16.15, and it's, it's, it reads, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that he is the first fruits of Archaea, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, or appointed themselves. Right. Um, so, in 
with verbs, verbs are can be active or passive. And for the sake of those listening, active is when the subject is the doer of it. And passive is when the subject is the receiver of the action. So, like John hit the ball. And in Greek, in Greek, there's another there's another voice. There's the middle, uh, middle voice. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Uh, but for the sake to itself, right? Mm-hmm. For the sake of this, I'm sticking with the two uh, the two voices that we have here. So, from First Corinthians and the one in First um, Corinthians 15 is in the active voice. They addicted themselves. They appointed themselves. But then you went back to Acts thirteen forty six. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be first have spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves, the word judge is crino, and it's in the act of voice. Judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And you connected that, you said, Well, this is the context, and you connected that with verse 48. And you inserted the word, they ordained themselves. But you cannot do that. And the reason why is that ordained is in the passive voice. In other words, they were the receiver of the action. They were not the doers. They could not ordain themselves. So um, um, I have well, to go I'm, I'm not sure that's I true. To... I've looked this up before. I don't, I don't, I'm sitting in a car right now. I don't, I don't have my Greek resources with me, but I have looked this up many times before. I, I recall, I think the active voice uh, and the if, middle if go, voice Steve, if you go to, are similar, are the same. Yes. What? No, no, they're, they're not the same. Active and passive are two different birds. If you go to Blue Letter Bible, you but can look the at same, it. But they often are the same form. They're often the same form. On the page. No, they're not. But the, let me one just is, say this. One is the doer, one is the, doer okay. of the action, the other one's the okay, receiver. Listen, I'm not going to I'm not going to argue about things that I'm not an expert on, and I don't think you are either. Maybe you if are. You, are are, are you, you a go Greek to, scholar? I'm not. Steve, if you if you go are to you Blue Letter scholar? Bible, if you go to Blue Letter Bible, it's right there. I, okay, I don't depend. Okay, I don't depend on Blue Letter Bible. I I depend on lexicons and other Greek sources, which I don't have right. with me right do, now. Do me a, do me a favor. I can't look, look that up now. But what I'm telling you is, I've looked it up before. I've looked it up before, and yeah. I'm not a Greek scholar, so I depend on those people who are. And I don't think you are. If you're using Blue Letter Bible for your information, you're not a Greek scholar either. So you and I are both talking about things that are nuanced beyond our expertise. But I will say that I've studied this out before, and I'm persuaded that when it says as many as were disposed to eternal life believed, uh, that this, it doesn't say, it doesn't matter whether they disposed themselves or someone else disposed them. They were disposed maybe by circumstances. It's hard to say. Sometimes life itself disposes you towards something. It doesn't say that God foreordained them to believe, and that's what you're trying to argue that he did. It doesn't say God, it, God's not even in the picture. I mean, he's not mentioned. So we, we can't say, this is saying God disposed them to believe. What this says is these people were disposed to eternal life, and therefore they believed. Now, what caused them to be disposed to eternal life? We don't know. It could be God. It could be something else. It could be themselves. It could be their, their life experiences. It could be, you know, something in Paul's persuasiveness, uh, that they were listening to. All we know is that they believed because they were disposed to eternal life in contrast to the other group that didn't believe because they judged themselves unworthy of eternal life in Paul's language. In other words, eternal life was presented to the crowd and there were two groups of people. Some uh, responded negatively to it. They were, as Paul says, they judged themselves unworthy of eternal life. The others were disposed toward it, and they believed. So this is this is the actual wording of the passage. Can I, you can imply or infer things from it if you want to, but that's what the passage says. Can you can you do me one favor? Can you do me one favor? Steve? Uh, depends. What is it? Can you look up that depends. word ordained? Can you look up that verb ordained and see that it is passive? You know, you must not be listening to me. I told you I'm sitting oh, in I'm a listening. car. I don't have my books with me. Well, okay, when you, ha- so you when didn't you get home. say that. Okay. When you get home. Well, when I've done home. it before. I'll do it again. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll Thanks. do it as many times as it needs to uh, be done. But, yeah, I've done this before. This is not a verse I'm unfamiliar with. I've debated with Calvinists, including uh, some of the major Calvinists I've debated with, and we've talked about that verse. And I've definitely done my research on it. It's uh, okay. there are things I don't remember about the exact 
Uh, I, th I think it's the middle voice and the and the active that are in the same form in Greek, or or it might be the passive and and the uh, middle that are. Th those are some things I don't remember. But what I do remember is that when I looked it up, it was ambiguous enough that it could mean that they disposed themselves, or something else disposed them, or God did. But the, it doesn't say in the passage what disposed them, and so we can't really insist on any one answer. I'm not insisting on any one answer, but I'm saying that in the context, Luke presents two groups of people responding differently to the offer of eternal life. One group negatively and the other positively. And the ones who had a positive response to eternal life believed because they wanted eternal life and believing is what they had to do to get it. Uh, there's nothing there that says that God ordained that they would believe. In fact, there's not, it doesn't even say that God or, ordained them for eternal life, but I mean, it, it could be implied if, if someone wishes to see it that way. But that, that's only one possible way of seeing it. And I personally don't believe that the idea of God uh, making people believe who otherwise would not is something Steve? that the Bible teaches. Steve? Yeah. May I read one more verse and then I'll get off the line, all right? Sure, of course. Uh, second, and I'm really appreciative of this uh, ministry. I really, it's really getting me to dig in. But um, Second Thessalonians two thirteen, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Thanks, Steve. Have a blessed night. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Hey, okay. and of course, I know that verse as well. That that verse is saying that God chose the Thessalonian church along with the rest of the churches uh, and to uh, find salvation through believing. Uh, so Thank they you. believed and God chose that they would, through that means, uh, 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 Calvinists and Arminians both believe that God chooses people. The question of on what basis does he choose them is where Calvinists and Arminians uh, disagree. Thanks, Steve. Oh, to, have, oh yeah. Have a, you, have a blessed let's night. Talk, let's talk to Abraham next. Okay, you too, bro. Let's call him. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Hi, Steve. Can you I, hear me? Yes, I do now. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, just first, in regards to the last caller's question with Acts 13:48, I'm not sure you even need to go grammatical. Um, you, you should go contextual before grammatical. And the the context of 44 through 48 is that the whole city showed up. The Jews weren't listening. Paul said, "We're going to turn to the Gentiles," and it's a common theme throughout Acts. And then Paul writes about it in Romans too. The Gentiles were, like you said, disposed to believe, and those who were who, who, did, who were disposed to believe and believed um, were ordained to eternal life. Um, but uh, I, I had a question for you, um, actually, not about the Bible, but just a Christian life type question. So uh, my wife and I have been attending a church for a couple of years, and it's been difficult for my wife, who is a stay-at-home mom, to connect with any other mom at the church, and she's the only mother at this church that homeschools our kids. And everyone else, um, every other mom has a job and sends the kids to public school, so no one's really available throughout the day. And the teaching, at, uh, the, uh, it's been difficult for my wife to make friends, and it's also been difficult for my kids to make friends, you know, to get together with anyone. Um, at the church, the teaching is a bit watered down. It's a programmatic, a bit flashy, modern church. We went there, uh, you know, because there was a robust kids ministry, and it also wasn't reformed, and we were both formally reformed. And uh, before, we came oh. from a small church plant that was really great, uh, but then we had to move to another town because of my job. And so when looking for a, a, another church possibly to go to, it seems very difficult to find one that is not dispensational or leans reformed yep. Calvin and, and also has parents. I'm a millennial, so has parents and kids for me and my wife to connect with. And I just want to know, you know, are my expectations too high? Uh, should we be flexible on the dispensationalism or on the Calvinism or just what you, what your advice is on this? Well, I would be, I'd be flexible on both if necessary to find uh, fellowship with good believers, because there are obviously good believers who are Calvinists and good believers who are dispensationalists. Um, it's 
preferable, obviously, to find people who agree with your own theology on those things because uh, you just share more in common. But I think, um, you know, if, if, a, if you're going to a church that pushes Calvinism or pushes dispensationalism in a big way, that might become irksome. And it might also make you unwelcome there because if they're pushy about it, then they probably aren't very happy about someone who's resistant to what they're pushing. Uh, but there are a lot of churches where the pastors would be maybe basically Calvinistic, but but they don't care about that doctrine and they don't push it or that lean toward dispensational. But it's just kind of a not not the issue for them. Obviously, some some denominations like Presbyterians are going to be pushing Calvinism as almost a defining doctrine for their denomination. And a, a group like Calvary Chapel and some others would be pushing dispensationalism as a defining doctrine. But there should be plenty of churches that don't, you know, they, they don't define their church by those particular doctrines, even if they happen to hold them. I, I fellowship very happily with dispensationalists and Calvinists if they, if they fellowship happily with me, not being of their camp. But I think probably what you need in a church most at this point as a homeschooler is other families that homeschool. And I think that would be the, that'd be the thing I'd be looking for first, just because your kids need to have other kids who, you know, from families that share your values. Now, Calvinism and dispensationalism are not values. They are opinions about esoteric mm -hmm. things. Uh, but your values of, you know, putting your kids first uh, keeping your kids, uh, you know, wholesome and t and introducing them to Christ and so forth. Other parents who have those values and are doing those with their kids are the ones that are going to be the most important relationships that you and your kids have. Um, so I would suggest, and maybe you've done this, but I would I would suggest that you, uh, you know, find a homeschool support group of which there's got to be lots of them now. I mean, when I was, when, when my kids were being homeschooled uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, there weren't that many homeschool groups around. There were some, but now there's, they're everywhere. And uh, you might already know some in your area, but I, I would find some homeschool co-op or something like that, where there's going to be a, you know, a collection of families who are homeschoolers. Now among them, you could ask where they go to church and if they have good churches or not. And some of them, they'll probably be from various churches, but you probably would have a selection then. And I would think that many of them would be from uh, Reformed churches, Calvinist churches, because the Reformed churches often have a big stress on homeschooling. But so do non-Reformed churches, especially some of the more Anabaptist types, like Mennonite type people. Sometimes they'll push homeschooling uh, in a bigger way than some do. But there's all kinds of denominations uh, that are favorable toward homeschooling. And I think that since that's, that's what defines your family at this point, is that you're raising your children a certain way and your children need a social group, I would suggest find that social group in a homeschooling co-op of some kind and then maybe from among there choose a church. If if the church you're in is not adequate, yeah, that's that's really good advice. There's a Christian Missionary Alliance church nearby. The pastor just fought through Revelation and was dispensationalist, but I think he actually mentioned um, the well, he did mention the four views. I'm not sure if he mentioned your book, The Four Views, but I don't know where else he would uh -huh. have gotten it because <laughs> your book is the well, place to well, go. I've read it myself. The Christian Missionary Alliance a denomination is not formally dispensationalist. Now, he, that pastor might be a dispensationalist. But, for example, uh, A.B. Simpson, uh, who founded that denomination, and A.W. Tozer, who was a guiding light in that denomination a generation later, uh, they were not dispensational. So um, it, it's probable that there are any number of uh, CMA uh, who are dispensationalists themselves, but they may not be pushing it because it's not necessarily a de denominational distinctive for them. And they're not Calvinistic either. So, I mean, that would be a positive. So I, and, and especially if there's homeschoolers there, you know, that's a good yeah, place yeah. to check. Yeah. Okay, Steve, thank you so much for your help. I really appreciate it. Okay, Abram, good talking to you. God bless you. God bless you. Good talking. All right, uh, we're going to be taking a break coming up here pretty quick. Um, because we do that at the bottom of the hour, and we do have another half hour coming up. So um, 
I hope you'll be uh, staying tuned. Um, and we do have some more callers after the break. If you want to get on the line and, and call in, the number to call is 84. Fifty-seven, thirty-seven. That's eight four four, four eight four, fifty-seven, thirty-seven. And I want to remind you that I am uh, uh, speaking in the Phoenix area in a variety of towns around Phoenix, uh, the next five days tonight included. And you can find information about those things at our website, thenarrowpath.com. The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry, and you can uh, donate from the website if you want to. Though everything available there is in fact free you can download for free uh, all of our uh, our downloadable resources and that's a lot uh, you can also write to us at the narrow path p.o box 1730 temecula california 92593 and that's uh, if you want to help support us or write to us what well, you can do that now we've got a half hour coming up so i'm going to be uh, i'll be back in a few seconds and uh, we'll talk to you again and you can call in. Everyone is welcome to call the narrow path and discuss areas of disagreement with the host. But if you do so, please state your disagreement succinctly at the beginning of your call and be prepared to present your scriptural arguments when asked by the host. Don't be disappointed if you don't have the last word or if your call is cut shorter than you prefer. Our desire is to get as many callers on the air during the short program, so please be considerate to others. to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith, we welcome you to call. If you see things differently from the host, as is sometimes the case with our callers, you're always welcome to call in and bring that up for conversation as well. Um, the number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Our next caller is Greg calling from Sacramento, California. Hi, Greg. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Uh, we need that. His volume turned up or something. Hello? Uh-oh. Can you hear me there now? Hi, Greg. I, oh. can, I can hear you oh. now. Yes, thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you. I'm calling for a friend. Uh, to, maybe she can listen to this later to, to hear your answer. But she's she's thinking on filing for divorce, uh, going through the the torment of having to make that decision. But they've been married for about 15 years or so. They've got a young one young child at home, less than five years old. Uh, basically, he's been addicted to drugs a lot, hit it a lot. He would disappear for nights at a time and overdose last year. So she's dealt with that. Uh, for a lot, and then recently, when he's relapsed again lately, he's back in the in the rehab place, um, and she's found all kinds of vile sex stuff on his phone, and he basically denies these things. He's in denial, and, and like before this last happened that time before uh, he went into the drug rehab, uh, he just left home for several days and just left them and said, "I'm." I'm not even going to tell you where I am. So her trust issues are just, she just kind of doesn't think she could take it anymore. Uh, he, he doesn't seem to be wanting help. Um, and yeah. uh, she's loving the Lord. She's trying to do what's right. And he's, he's, he's going to fellowship in our, our class and things, the married couples class and things at church. I think he seems to have known the Lord, but he's just hidden this stuff. He's always hidden stuff. So where he's at with God, I don't really know, but, but, uh, well, I think he has some you know, mental issues. The, the, the behavior you describe, I believe, fits well within the categories that the Bible has as grounds for divorce. If not, you know, he may not have committed adultery, 
although it sounds like he's using pornography on, on his phone, but uh, even if he hasn't committed adultery, he has abandoned the family, and he's refusing to be a dad and a, and a husband. Uh, you know, I mean, Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, 7 that if an unbelieving husband does not want to stay in the marriage doesn't want he, he doesn't want to dwell with his wife and that means as a husband obviously it doesn't just mean hang around and live under the roof paul means if a husband wants out and he's an unbeliever then the wife should let him go and she is not under bondage paul says in that case so i think she's free if she makes that choice now of course if she if she says but i'm not sure he's not a christian now, you can be pretty sure he's not a christian his behavior is not christian now, if he's yeah. crying out to God for help and making every effort to, to be repentant and to reform his life, uh, but he's, he's just weak, well, then maybe he is a Christian. Maybe he's a very weak Christian. But uh, if, he's, you know, he, if he's not interested in keeping his vows or, or living a godly life or any of those things, uh, then he doesn't give any evidence of being a Christian. When a person says they're a Christian, that means almost nothing unless there is some pretty, you know, consistent evidence. Because being a Christian doesn't mean you say you believe something. Being a Christian means you are now a follower of Christ. You believe he is your Lord, he's your king, and that's that defines your worldview. That defines who you are. Uh, so, I mean, it's very clear this man doesn't have that going for him. So he's not what what anyone in the early church would recognize as a Christian. I realize that in the modern church, sometimes a pe people can be very ill-behaved and, and be, because they say they're Christians, the church just takes their word for it. But that's, of course, very disagreeable with what the Bible indicates is what a Christian is. So sounds to me like the, the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 12 through 15 would apply to her. And I don't generally encourage people to divorce especially when there's children involved. But if he's beaten her, if, he's, if she's in danger, and the child may well be in danger too, uh, and he's not interested in being, you know, uh, fulfilling his role that he made vows to keep at the altar, he doesn't want to be a husband, uh, then he certainly doesn't want to be a Christian. And yeah, and I'm not... That being so, I think she's free. And I'm not so sure that he's not where he wouldn't say he would you come home it, it you know he's i think he's he's just being comfortable being taken care of in the rehab places and and this and that but but it's just that she can't trust him anymore and he's he's not showing any desire to get help and he just does these things and denies these things and and i think he'd probably maybe come home just so he could be taken care of i, I don't know exactly he's he said to well, her does he go to rehab because he, you say he's not interested in help but he goes to rehab uh Usually, if, if someone goes to rehab, they are seeking help. But um, are you just saying well, that I think, when he gets out of rehab, he doesn't show any more interest in in being clean and sober? Yeah, he's he's just still relapsing and doing these weird things, and and just I, I think he kind of wanted to get back into rehab because right when he got his job back after he lost it, uh, he, he, okay, he, well, he let me say this 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 is kind of complex. More yes, complex yes. than I can resolve here, uh, but it sounds to me that he doesn't uh, have any convincing evidence of being a follower of Christ, and uh, or give convincing evidence of wanting to be a, a husband to his wife and, and a father to his child, and those things, to my mind, put him in the category that Paul talked about in First Corinthians seven. Now, if if the lady isn't sure that she has grounds for divorce, she could at least. Uh, separate from him for the safety of herself and the child and uh, and say that, you know, I'm not going to live with you again until I see that you're, you know, cleaning up your life in a way that's dangerous to us. And she doesn't have to get divorced uh, or move on. That is, she doesn't have to move on to the point of, you know, seeking to remarry or anything. Yeah. If she can't yeah. trust him, then she she can't very well stay with him. Uh, if there's questions as to whether she has grounds for divorce or not, then uh, she can she could go to a safe place and and not divorce him. 
Yes. She just wants being get concerned about legal things to protect her son too if 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 divorce well, versus Yeah, and, and that's true. I mean and that's complex. Well yeah. she she would be more legally she would be more legally got a divorce. Um there is such a thing, though people don't do it very much anymore. There's such a thing as a legal separation which isn't considered to be a divorce. The person who's separated doesn't see themselves as you know, out on the dating market, they're not eligible to remarry, but they are not legally responsible for their spouse's activities. That's, uh, again, it's a very rare thing. Uh, many lawyers suggest that it doesn't even, people don't even do it anymore because usually a legal separation is just the first step toward a divorce. But but it is possible to uh, to do that. It, Legally protected, but I, I don't. You'd have to talk. She'd have to talk to a lawyer about that. Can I don't know? Can she bibli- biblically say if she divorced him, could she biblically remarry him down the road if he was to change enough to convince her? I, I would think so. I would think so. Some people oh. would try to say no based on Deuteronomy 24, but that would not be a parallel to the Deuteronomy 24 situation. Deuteronomy 24 says that if a man divorces his wife and she goes and marries another man, and then she finds herself free again because her second husband divorces her or dies, she can't go back to the first husband. But see, it doesn't say if a woman leaves her husband and then comes back to her husband, she can't come back. It's if she gets married in the meantime, uh, then she has broken off uh, all options of being with her husband. But, you know, uh, Hosea's wife, uh, Gomer, uh, was left him and uh, and he took her back and uh, you know there's it's a very different situation than Deuteronomy 24. Well thank you so much that, so that will, I, would say I yes. think this is going to help her a lot this will help her a lot uh, in making these decisions okay. I appreciate you appreciate the time thank you Steve. Okay thank you Greg all right God bless, bless you bye-bye. Okay our next caller you too our next caller is Fred from Alameda California and uh, and our number is 844 844- Four eight four fifty seven thirty seven. Hi, Fred. Hi. I wanted to ask you a question yesterday, but I couldn't get on. I, I called later and I couldn't get on. And um, it's the well, you're question on now. is. You're on now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the preacher on the radio that used to come out of Atlanta, Georgia, Charles F. Stanley. He said. Um, he said God doesn't mind repeating himself because he knows we are such hard listeners and i have a question about where something's documented in the bible it it connects with that statement um that charles stanley made um j vernon mcgee was asked a question on his program by a listener and the question was if the sin that david committed with Bathsheba was going to have such severe consequences. <clears throat> Why didn't God warn him beforehand? And the first thing J. Vernon McGee said after he read that was, how many times do you want God to tell him? If God told him once, it would have been enough. So my question is, right. where is that? I mean, outside the Ten Commandments, where is that if you know in the Bible, where God actually spoke to David directly, warning him about Bathsheba and Uriah, or something like that happening. Well, God. There was the law of God that said you don't but your neighbor's wife, you don't commit adultery. Yes. Uh, that. That was repeated multiple times in the law, and okay. it's a given. I mean, and I mean, it was, it's it's a given. You you know, uh-huh. that's what marriage is. Marriage is that two people become exclusively each other's, and outsiders are not welcome. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, David certainly would have known. He would have known that it was wrong for someone to to sleep with one of his wives, mm-hmm. you know, for someone else to do it. So I mean, I mean. God didn't owe him any other special warnings. Actually, David got off pretty easy because yeah, of the law. Yeah, but it sounded like Jay Vernon McGee was saying that God did, did give him special warnings. And I was just wondering, like, where is that in the Bible? Because no, I can't. No, 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 no. no. Jay Vernon McGee 
if he said David already had been warned, J. Vernon McGee meant in the law. Mm -hmm. He had read the law. He meditated on the law day and night. Mm -hmm. I mean, Psalm 119 or Psalm 1 or, or the many Psalms where David talked about how he delighted to meditate on God's law. He knew mm -hmm. the law. And, uh, and so, I mean, it's not like he needed to be told in a special case. It's like, you know, the Bible says you should not steal. But mm -hmm. if I'm walking through a store and there's something there I don't want to pay for and I want to take it out with me, do I need a special revelation from God? Oh, no, no Steve, don't do that. I don't want you to do that. No, he's already told us that. When God has spoken, yeah. he doesn't need to keep telling us in each case. It's, uh, his principles are the same all the time. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Fred. Thank you. Good talking to you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, we'll talk next to Vernon. Speaking of J. Vernon McGee, we'll talk to Vernon from Sacramento. Uh, Vernon, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Uh, we need his phone activated. I don't have control of that where I'm sitting. Maybe his volume needs to go up? Studio, can we get Vernon's uh, line on? What? Hello? Okay. Hey, Vernon? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can now. Go ahead. Okay. I called once before and we got off onto a tangent regarding a peripheral issue or subject. And my question is that the third of the angels in the, New Te in the Old Testament that were cast to the realms of earth. They were the cherubim and seraphim and uh, some of the archangels, I don't know how much, how many of which category, but a third of the myriads of angels, that's a lot of angels, were cast to earth. And could, what's keeping me, when I'm, my question is, in your opinion, what is keeping me, for example, uh, from believing that they are these entities that are, uh, the, since Area 51, the Roswell thing, uh, and now they have ancient aliens, there's a lot of information that's out on, to the public that wasn't before. Do you think they could be those fallen angels? Well, first of all, actually, the Bible doesn't say anything about a third of the angels. The Bible does say in two places that there are fallen angels, but uh, the number one-third is never given. Uh, uh -huh. The idea that a third of the angels did fall is from Revelation 12, I think it's verse 4, where it talks about how the dragon, with his tail, cast a third of the stars of the heavens and cast them to the earth. Right now, if if we assume if we assume that the stars are angels, then that would be where we get the idea. But there's no reason to assume they are angels. So actually, the imagery of stars being cast to the earth before, before chapter eight and verse ten, where uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, an evil king, is said to have uh, cast the hosts of heaven or the stars to the earth and trampled upon them. This is a reference to righteous people, not to angels. So there's really no clear place in the Bible that speaks of a third of the angels falling. But there are fallen angels. There are demons. And, um, you know, could they be what some people have seen and, and maybe, uh, maybe possibly mistaken for space aliens? I certainly cannot say. I, I don't know. I haven't seen any of these myself. Uh, if I did see them, I'm not what I'm looking at. So, um, uh, you know, I will say it's a very common Christian idea. Aliens really is not dealing with um, aliens from other planets, but are dealing with these evil spirits, these demonic beings. Uh, Christians often say that is true, and it could well be that that is true. I don't, I don't know that it is or when we get into the subject, we're talking about things that the Bible doesn't tell us anything about, which means if we want to answer it, we're going to have to get it from somewhere other than the Bible. But I don't know other than the Bible find out about such stuff. I guess uh, 
I, I guess you could listen to Coast to Coast every night and you'll, you'll hear all kinds of stuff. But, um, you know, I don't I don't trust everything I hear. So all I can say is uh, it is, I guess, a possibility that that many or most or all of these sightings are uh, demons. Uh, also, it's a possibility that they are not and that they are to be explained some other way because the Bible does not answer that question for us. But thank you. I've seen thank you for your pictures, call. A- actual uh, evidence of actual downed aircraft for the flying saucers, UFOs, and that seems to me to be something that is before our ability to create those craft. I, I, I think that's correct. I've heard that before. And so that... that... Yeah. Okay. Here. Next to Les from Sacramento. Uh, again, uh, we've got three from Sacramento. Uh, yeah, Steve, are you there? Uh-huh. Hello? Go ahead. Is it? Yeah, this is Les. Is this Steve? Can you not hear me? Yeah, okay, I got you. This Listen, is I. Steve, you I, don't want to, I don't want to take a lot of time because we're running out of time. What my question was, and then I'm going to hang up and I'll listen on the radio because I'm in my car. I've heard before, uh, and I don't know where in the Bible, I don't know my Bible as well as I should, but is there a place in the Bible, because there are so many languages in the world today, that God put a curse on us for that? And I've heard that before, but I wanted to make sure with you. So I'm going to hang up and then I'll listen on my radio. And thank you for taking my call, Steve. Thank you, buddy. Okay, Les, thanks for your call. Um, is there a statement in the Bible that says God put a curse on us for having many languages? Uh, the answer is uh, the, the reason there are many languages is because God interfered with a project, a rebellious project that early humans were involved in after the flood. They were seeking to disobey God's instructions after the flood. In Genesis 9, 1, God told Noah's family to be fruitful, multiply, and and spread out and fill the earth. And in chapter 11 of Genesis, we read that uh, some want that to happen. They didn't want humans to spread out and uh, fill the earth. And so they, they came up with a rebellious project to start what probably was to be a one world religion. They were building a shrine. Uh, we call it the Tower of Babel, but uh, what, uh, these these towers in that region that archaeologists have found are usually called ziggurats, and they are uh, they're related to astrology. They're related to stargazing, and it may be that there was a an astrological religion, and uh, the Tower of Babel is to be a temple to the stars. That's a very possible explanation. In which case they were trying to do something to keep people united and together instead of spreading out over the earth, as God had told them to do. Now, uh, because of that, God didn't want them to fulfill that project, so he confused their languages, and they couldn't understand each other. There were no doubt, you know, groups of people, no doubt people, you know, formed groups with those who spoke the same language they did, they could communicate with, and they, you know, separated into different groups, different nations, eventually. So we, the presence of many languages came about as a result of God judging a rebellious effort. But it, I, I'm not sure if you were, it sounded like you're asking, is God cursing us because we have languages, many languages, as if maybe having many languages was offensive to him. I, if that's what you meant, then I'd have to say no. If you're asking, are there many languages because of a, a judgment that God brought upon uh, people? Yes, the answer to that would be yes. Okay, so uh, we'll talk to Jennifer from uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me? Hi. Steve? Oh. Uh, yes. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, you're breaking up a little bit for me. Oh, boy, I only got a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm a person of a few words anyway. I first want to say, though, I appreciate you in the ministry on so many levels, okay? God bless you. May he continue to bless you, your family, in ministry. Okay, um, I wanted to bring this up on um, 
uh, on uh, marriage and divorce. Matthew 5.31 says, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And other manuscripts say, whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Those are two different things. Because the other manuscripts are really saying, <clears throat> excuse me, whoever um, separates, that the Greek word means separates um, or, or sends her away, puts her away. It, it doesn't mean divorce. So whoever separates from his wife or sends her away, let him do it legally uh, by giving her that certificate of divorce where she can go to the legal process and get her dowry back. I guess you know about all that stuff. They have a ketubah. <clears throat> I think that's the, um, the the certificate of divorce. And then she gets back her her money that he has to give her. So that's why um, God was saying. Let me here, jump in here. Do it. Let me jump in here. Okay. Okay. Uh, I need you to. I need you to listen to me now. Um, okay. I just read a paper, a twenty-page paper that somebody sent me uh, yesterday, uh, uh -huh. trying to make this very point: uh, the point that there's a different word in the Old Testament and in the Greek of the New Testament uh, that means divorce, which means uh, you know to to give a writing of divorcement to make it legal, than the word for sending away. Uh, that the common mm -hmm. word that is used when we see the word divorce in our Bible is actually a word that means sending away. So let not the man right. send away his wife. Uh, but if, right. um, and so what you, you're saying, what you're saying is that uh, what was forbidden, at, at least this, this paper mm -hmm. was saying, it sounds like what you're saying is that what's mm -hmm. forbidden is sending your wife away without divorcing her is not right. fair because it's if wrong. you're not going to yeah. live with her, uh, you should make it legal. You should make it legal, right? Right. And uh, right. and that and and that's possibly true. Now I've read other scholars yeah, the, the who have said that the, sending wait, away I, I is this. an expression in the. Uh, what do you uh, want to say? Okay. Oh, what I wanted to say was so because uh, the Greek word is a polio, and it's used in the, in the same um, uh, phrase here, Matthew thirty-one. It's used in a few places. Uh, so when it, it says here, okay. except for the grounds of, of sexual immorality, that is only there because, you know, the people get stoned to death. That's why that clause is there. So telling somebody that's the only way you can divorce somebody is for sexual immorality or them being unfaithful. That's not. That's really not what okay. it means here. Okay. Because Jennifer, God did divorce in Thank place. you for your he call. Could, Jennifer, you know, Jennifer, please, yeah, yeah, please yes, listen. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That's 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 fine. I've, we're coming up to the end of the show. Uh, you've said what you want to say, and I appreciate it. Let me say something if I could. I have also read from scholars who've said that the word to send away was simply an idiom in the Hebrew for divorcing. Now, so I've heard both things. I've heard that sending away was different than divorce, and that the divorce refers to the legal divorce, and that and that people were not supposed to send away their wife without divorcing them legally. But then I've heard from other scholars that in the Hebrew usage, sending away was just an idiom or euphemism for divorce. So there's apparently a difference of opinion about it, but I appreciate you sharing yours. We don't have any time to hear any more uh, about it today, but I appreciate your call. You've been listening to The Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are listener-supported as a ministry. You can uh, help us stay on the air if you want to by writing to The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Or go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us, and let's talk again tomorrow. God bless.